came with this week was there's a power in the universe and that we can all use it. But we have to be in contact with that power in the universe. And, and we have to come from the heart space with that power. So it's similar to, for those that were on the, the call and as we started, when Georgia asked for prayers and, and I said, we have to let, lift her prayers up because it's her emotion and passion that understand the universe understands. Okay, so we have to move out of what I call duality thinking and into the heart, which is where unity exists. Okay, so, so as, as we all know, or in case you didn't know, when a, a theme is set for the week, it starts working the person that gets to present it. So better together, better together in a, um, inclusion option so your first the first discussion this month under this theme was let's take together and fill our right i think that's kind of what that song does i'd like to teach the world to sing it brings us all together right and then and then the second week i think reverend robert talked about um who we are who we are as individuals who we are collectively and then um the third week was about colorblind or colorful, and then today better together. So one of the things, sometimes as a uh, speaker, you tell stories of your childhood. They're not they're not meant to brag. They're meant to to help you think about about a thought. So for me, my childhood was rich. My, my parents taught me not to see color, which I, as I've grown older, I've realized that that was not necessarily a good teaching, but I understand where the teaching was from. My, I was raised in Southern California and I feel very blessed to have been raised there. We were raised in Gardena Torrance and if anybody's familiar with the area or the history, most of the um, Japanese that were interned were interned from that area. Gardena Torrance was farmland, strawberry farmland. My grandparents lived in what today is called Watts, Los Angeles. So the reason I share this is because diversity was always part of my childhood. We were actually, we were the corner house on a street 164th that went this way, spinning that went this way. Spinning was predominantly Japanese from the, there were people that had survived Japan. There were people that, Japanese families that had survived in Hawaii and there was Japanese families that were interned. And yet among them, they fought. And they fought because those that were in Japan got to keep their history in their, their property. Those that were in Hawaii had Hawaiian property. And then those that were here in the United States, unfortunately were interned. Also on this street, so this street was Buddhist, this street was predominantly Catholic, and there we lived on the corner, and we were the only Protestants. Further down the street, we had a um, Holocaust survivor. She was a child in Auschwitz that survived, and she actually taught us how to count with the number that was on her arm. Across the street from us, there was a um, Mrs. Sakai, and Mrs. Sakai's family had helped a downed um, U.S. airplane pilot um, get back out of, he was downed in Japan and helped him get out of the Japan and back to his family. And she had no idea that he was from, they had no idea that he was from a well-to-do family. And um, when, and she just, it just happened to be Hiroshima and she was brought to the United States by his family because of what her family had done for them. And she bore the scars of Hiroshima. I share this because that's the diversity I grew up with on the street and on the children I played with. Then when we went to visit my grandparents, there were always, um, it was all, always a multi, cultural experience because there were black families, there were um, Mexican families, and there were Japanese families there also. And so when I say 
I'm, um, I was raised not to see color, it's because I played with all those kids on the street. I was taught that we all bleed and we all uh, want, this, we all hope and dream. But now as I've gotten older and as I've um, gained insights and as I've evolved, I and my work life used to be accused of having the um, United Nations on my team. I actually can say in, in a period of time in the last 10 years, I actually worked for a predominantly male-oriented leadership team that was predominantly white. And I'm not saying anything against that. Yet, I always got accused of having the United Nations team. And, and my, I would be a smart Alec because that's part of who I am. And I would say, I do have a United Nations team, and one day we're all going to have flags on our desk for the countries we represent because of our heritage. Okay, and and out of the, out of my seven member team, I probably had ninety countries represented. In, okay, but I when I hired when I was a hiring manager and when I was hiring for technical people, I hired based on their experience. And I hired based on what they knew they could do. I didn't hire them to get a check mark for myself or the company by having the multinational. So because of our teachings, I was looking at them as being a divine, a divine representation of God. Okay. So as we talk about better together, I'm also reminded of a um poem that talked about the master's plan and it talked about a tapestry. Now many of us have spent time looking at beautiful tapestries. We can see them in museums, we see them in our homes. Many of us have um, beautiful rugs that are a tapestry in on our floors in our houses. But have you ever looked behind the tapestry? The tapestry we see is a beautiful picture. But behind it is woven many things. And it, it might not look as beautiful as we think when we look on the back side. But we're looking at the, the front side and we're saying, wow, look at those colors. Look what it represents. Look what it brings together. Because it's better together. Okay. So it, as we, we go through, the, the world has a lot of things going on right now especially the United States. And, and the, the idea is that we see each person for who they are, similar to how the song was. The song was in perfect harmony and they all had a different flair of attitude with them. But when they got to the part where they were singing about harmony, they were in harmony. And, and so where does that show up in our life? How does that show up in our life? What do we do with that? And, and for me, I think it begins and ends with active listening. Do we take the time to just listen to the person who's talking to us? Do we, or are we too busy rushing to know what the answer is already? Or to tell them what we think they wanna hear? Or do we really take the time and say to somebody, that doesn't look like us, that isn't of our cultural background, that isn't part of science of mind, religious science, do we take the time to say to them, tell me what you believe. Tell me about your creator. Because at the end of the day, we all know that there's only the one, regardless of the name, there's only the one. And that in the eyes of the beloved, we are unique expressions of his love. We, you know, within religious science, religion, and within science of mind, we believe that we are a part of God. We are not all of God. And yet God experiences life through each and every one of us. So back to the talk about um, the discussion about the song being from our childhood. I love to teach the world to sing. You know, there was another phrase from that time period of my life too, and that was, God doesn't make junk. You know, I, I'm good because God, hello, God doesn't make junk. 
And so do you really approach people and see them as the expression of God? Do you see from the heart versus from the head? And, and I'm just throwing out ideas for you to think about. Emerson says, if you touch the life of one person, and that could be through listening, if you touch the life through one person, your life has been successful. The Talmud says that if you save one life, you've saved the world. And the truth is, that could be our own selves. That could be our own thinking. If we, if we just change that for a moment and, and understand the, the higher truth of life, then we've changed our life and we've changed the people that we've come in contact with. And, and I know right now in, in the shelter and home, the shelter and grace, whatever you're choosing to call it, we've all been changed. We've all been changed to look at things differently. Like if you do go out and you're, and you're in the store, how do they know you're smiling? Have you, have you moved that into your eyes so your eyes sparkle? Okay. Because, you know, so much of us have been used to facial communication, and yet we're used to this part of the face communicating. But are we used to the whole part of the face communicating? As you get out of your car and you walk in to a store, do you walk in with the intention, I'm going to let my light shine? I'm going to let it shine. It's going to show up in my face. It's going gonna, it's gonna to show up in my brightness. It's going to show up in my eyes. Because who cares about this part? Yet at the same time, if you're smiling here, it'll show up. Okay. And, and so your task this week is, if you're out and about, is, is just to see if you can see the divine in others without seeing, without seeing their, their, their lips turn up. Okay. The other part is, you know, the, I, I think in California right now, I, I've always said that the COVID has brought the world together to its knees. It's brought it to its knees. I mean, when have you ever heard that the entire world has had a shutdown? Okay. And yet it's also where Mother Nature's healing herself. You know, it's, it's, it's been a long time since I knew that por porpoises um, were part of the canal system in Venice. It's all, you know, we had, we had up until recently, we had clean air. Okay. Yet we also know that I'm sure, Nate, by, by your house, that you have done a lot of work around your house to keep, to keep your house safe in regards to the needles pulled back and I know Lucy, that's the same for you in, in the Santa Cruz mountains that you live in, that, that you, you keep your property safe, but it's the other part of the dryness that the lightning struck. And, and, and then within the, the lightning strikes, there's other energies that take place. There's, they have their own micro systems within the fire that we can't control. But the truth is what's going on? The earth has always taken a way to clear itself. It doesn't need to do it the way it is now. And we're lifting prayers for those that are in impacted areas and, we're, um, and for those that are on the um, evacuation call. But how collectively, think about, think about the, the firefighters that are out there. It's a collective group of people that are working together for one goal, and that's to put out the fires. We as a uh, religious organization, we, uh, we're being called to our knees again to lift in prayer the prayers of our, our friends, the prayers of the state, the prayers of the states, because there's, California's not the only one on fire, Colorado's on fire. You know, we know that the rains will come. There's a lot of people, I was talking to my friend uh, Nadini yesterday and she's of a um, Hindu faith. 
And she was telling me that in the temple, they are praying for the rain gods. They are praying to the rain gods to bring rain. So everybody's working better together. And so collectively, we have to look at ourselves. Where am I better together when I align my words from my heart, from my soul, versus just thinking out? In the class, um, in the uh, money class that we've been doing on Thursday nights, we talked about when you look down, there's a certain energy, there's, a, there's more of a negative response energy that, that holds us heavy. When you look straight ahead, you're more coming from the intellect when we're doing, and especially when we're doing our prayers. And when you look up to the area between the seal, where the ceiling and the wall meets, when you look up, you raise your eyes to the heavens from where all things come. And, and so that's, that's a great biblical quote. You know, I lift my eyes to the hills. So we need to lift our eyes to the hills for those in the fire area to know that, that the beloved's in motion regardless of our appearances. So back to the theme of the month, inclusive, you know, inclusion in action. We're being called forward into diversity. Not that we weren't there before. In fact, your uh, opening statement says we're a welcoming community. What does that mean? We're a welcoming community. When people walk in the door, do they feel like they, they've come home? When, when people, and I'm talking about home to themselves, like the prodigal son, when he came home to himself, he could return anywhere. Better together. He was together so he could walk in and be together with those that he was with. So um, there's a, a great song that, um, that um, is done by Mr. Walker. It's a gospel song and it says, I need you to survive. Okay. And, and the, the first line is, I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me. Agree with me. We're all a part of God's body. And, and the thing is, when they're talking about agree with me, the agreement is that we're all a part of God's body. You know, it's like namaste. The God in me sees the God in you. But if I don't know that in me, how can I see it in you? But we're better together when we come from that place. And we have to own that. We have to own being able to say to, to each other, tell me about you. Tell me about your childhood. Tell me about what you, you believe in. It's, it's one of the things in religious science is imagine we imagine a world that works for everyone, okay? But do we take the time as individuals to ask, tell me about your world that works? And then do we say, I hear you, I see you, and I support your world with love. And, and really truly mean it, okay? Because what, what I notice in the world, we're too busy, not as religious science, just this is a general statement. We're too busy telling other people, other countries, our way of life works best. Well, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't in their circumstances. But we have to ask them what their world looks like. We have to understand what their hopes and dreams are. As you know, I would imagine everybody on this call, we have a common theme, it's called religious science. But do we really know the hopes and dreams of each other? Have we, have, and, and you know, you're, you're, I mean, especially now, as we're in the community of life on Zoom. How many of you miss being able to hug people at church? How many of you miss holding hands? 
at church with, for the last song. How many of you miss the social gathering? Okay. So those are the common things we share. How many of you miss to see each other smiles? You get to see those here. Okay. You get to see the comforts of everybody's homes, where they're taking the call from. And you know what, Bobby, I think this is the first time that we only have one person joining that's not in their house. And that would be Nat from his car. Okay, but usually, usually when I've been on the calls before, people have been at the beach or they've been outside taking the call. And, and I understand why you're not outside today because of the, the weather, okay? But how many other than that, how many of us really knew what people's, what people's offices looked like? And what you can glean just from knowing that, like, wouldn't you like to know what some of the books are that Bobby has on her bookshelves? Yeah, you know? Wouldn't you like to know what Christy really cooks in that kitchen? That, that we've, we have, have had other than what she's brought in for, um, for the potlucks that we have? Or what really does Gail have sitting across from her? Is her TV directly across from her uh, chair that she's in? And doesn't that look like a very comfortable chair? Okay, you know, do we, but do we ask those things? Like, for example, Meg, did you crochet your, um, your blanket that's behind you? Okay. No, but it was a gift, right? No, yeah. So, I mean, or what's really on the whiteboard behind Christy? Like, now, I, I get that Nat's either got an SUV, but what really is this car? And Amber, I'm kind of curious what the yellow is on the side of your window. Is it is it a stuffed animal or is it a flower? Oh, okay. So, you know, but but see, and now look at all of your guys' smiles. You know, as 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 I've pointed out, like, you know, seriously, what's the pictures that Bob has hanging over his uh left shoulder? Are they family pictures or are they paintings that he's done? You know, what, what is it that we could tell each other that sometimes we're afraid to tell each other, but more importantly, we're afraid to ask. And then our job is just to actively listen, to hear. That's how we become better together. We're all individual expressions, okay? And we want to be individual expressions, but there's a common thread that unites all of us. And it's not just religious science, it's not just this community. The common thread is the beloved, the divine. The common thread is the divine. And when we can see that in each other, then we truly are better together. Okay, so Lucy's added her pictures now. So, you know, I don't know if you guys know Lucy, she's a friend of mine. She's not far, she's in Santa Cruz area. So, um, Thank you for joining us, you know, but we're better together. We're enriched together. And, and, and how do we take that forward into the world and appreciate diversity is not just um, the, the color of somebody's skin. It's not just the um, ethnicity that they bring to the table. It's not just their religious beliefs. Diversity is each and every one of us being counted, each and every one of us being heard. You know, a lot of us would say, yeah, I'm a part of this group, but you also like to be individual, especially, especially Americans. Americans like to say, I'm an individual, don't lock me in. And then, of course, then we have different groups that will say, well, then there's the coast people and then there's the, the middle America people. And then there's in California, there's the northern California versus the southern California. No, I'm proud to be a Californian. I'm proud to have German heritage ancestors that came over um, way before the Civil War started. I'm proud to have Irish ancestors that came over. 
But at the end of the day, I'm an American. And I'm also a human being. And, and fortunately, because of my dad working for Pan Am, I've also traveled the world. You know, that, why do you think I have a college degree? Because I could fly anywhere for $10. Okay, so, the, and I could see the world. And, and as a woman traveling in the 70s and 80s outside the United States, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. It's, it's easier today to, to do those travels, but, it, but I got to experience it. And I also, when I traveled, I went into those countries understanding the rules of those countries. I, didn't, I went in as an American tourist, but I didn't go in wanting to see America. I went in and, I, and before I took those trips, I read to understand what their culture was so that I didn't spit my gum on the streets in Taiwan. Okay, it's, it comes to being respectful, which also comes back to active listening. When we're in front of somebody, it's on us to ask them. And then to just quiet our brain and listen. To, to greet them from that namaste place and to listen. So that, that is how we become better together. My friend Gail and I one time were taking a class and it was really funny because the first part of the class was called um, Step Into the Future. And for those that have been around religious science for a while, you may know the name Paulette Sun and Michael Davis. It's the class that they taught. And um, we took it here in Oakland and the first part of this, the exercise, the first part of the weekend was Friday night. And you had to go around and you had to tell somebody who you were. And you only had a few minutes to say, you know, my name is Kathleen and I'm da da. And you, you told your story. And the person listening could only say thank you. Thank you. And then you heard their story and they said thank you. And then you did this like three or four times. And what we discovered was our stories got better because we started changing our stories based on what we had heard. Okay. That's, that's what gets better when you're better together. Our life changes, our story changes so that we can communicate in the world we get clarity on who we are. We give clarity to those that, that are listening. So, um, Emma Curtis Hopkins said, if we keep our focus on our relationship with God, if we keep our focus on our relationship with God, then our life is better. So I would add to that, if we keep our focus on our relationship with God in the person standing across from us or setting across from us or on the screen next to us, our life gets better. And with that, I'll just bring it to a close and I'll go into prayer. So if you take a moment and take a breath together, breathing in the divine, and letting that breath fill us to the bottom of our soul, our feet. And then we exhale and exhale a white breath and we exhale into God. And as those of you have been on these calls before, you know I'm into the triune nature of God. So let's take another breath together. This time stopping at the heart for a moment. And then going down to the bottom of our souls and back out, exhaling into God. And one more breath in. And exhaling out. For the truth is, God is all there is. And each of us on this call, each of us listening to this call, each of us in the world are God's beloved children. And as we learn to see that, to be that, to know that in the world, we truly are better together.
And as I speak my word now, I speak my word for anywhere the truth is being shared. It could be in the prayer room of someone's home. It could be in the mosque. It could be in the temple. It could be in the cathedral. It could be outdoors in a gathering. For we know that God is there. I also speak my word for the leaders of our nation, of our nations, of the world, knowing that they're divinely guided to make decisions that are in the highest good for all that they are responsible for governing. And today, especially today, I speak my word for the firefighters, the first responders, for those in areas that have been impacted by acts of God known as fires, rains, hurricanes, that they understand that they are in God's embrace, loving embrace, regardless of appearances. I lift our prayers for the Senate being those wild animals those that are scattering the hills for safety, those that are responsible for the care of animals and getting them out of their areas to safety. And it's with a grateful heart I know that the rains will come. The heat will lower, in the, especially here in the state of California, and that among that, in the midst of that, the fires go out. And it's with gratitude, it's with grace, it's with a great thanksgiving that I know these words to be true, that I lift them and ask you to lift your arm and lifting them to God. And I ask you to join me by saying, and so it is, amen.